Hello, GMAIR followers. This is Dr. Jennifer Joe, GMAIR ambassador. Today, I'm delighted to be interviewing Eden Engel Rebenser and Dr. Daniel Stokes on their GMAIR infodemiology original paper, Partisan Differences in Legislators' Discussion of Vaccination on Twitter During the COVID-19 Era, Natural Language Processing Analysis. Eden and Daniel, welcome. My name is Eden. My background uh, research-wise is in the area of health services uh, research, and I'm particularly interested in questions around patient decision-making, particularly in settings that are kind of clinically ambiguous, especially around opioid prescribing. Um, and that interest led me eventually to being interested in how patients make decisions about whether or not to obtain the COVID vaccine um, and to use this kind of novel data set to look at um, how politicians uh, talk about that vaccine. And I am Dan Stokes, and my research uh, so far primarily involved using non-traditional sources of narrative data, uh, largely on social media, like with Twitter, uh, but also on online discussion forums like Reddit and online review sites like Yelp. Um, and all of that with the goal of better understanding how key stakeholders, including um, healthcare facilities, but also patients and politicians are thinking about and discussing issues um, around individual and public health. Your paper looks at vaccine hesitancy or a delay in the acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite the availability of vaccines. Can you talk more about vaccine hesitancy and why you decided to examine the content and politicization of legislator communication on Twitter. So vaccine hesitancy is kind of a longstanding problem that both predates and will probably outlast this pandemic. Um, we know uh, in the HPV era, there was a whole interesting body of literature around uh, politicized coverage of that vaccine. Um, and in the case of COVID, there continues to be a significant uh, problem with vaccine hesitancy and that that hesitancy is a much bigger problem in Republican leaning areas of the country. Um, so COVID has been no exception. Um, we thought that political figures were a really interesting group to think about uh, during this pandemic um, for a few reasons. Um, I think first of all, because there's really interesting uh, experimental evidence that exposure to politicized communication about vaccination, it decreases um, willingness to get vaccine and can increase suspicion of uh, providers. Um, so I think that experimental evidence alone is kind of compelling for why this is an interesting population. And then uh, thinking about legislators in particular who were the subject of this paper, not only are they um, kind of political figures, but they also legislate. And so that means they can um, dictate some of the policy that greatly impacts vaccine uptake, whether that's about the availability of the vaccine, whether or not it's required, how much it costs. So they're quite powerful actors. And then I think the last thing that I think about that makes this such an interesting population is their role as public figures. There's a really uh, neat body of literature around what happens when public figures talk about public health interventions online. So Katie Couric uh, went on a whole campaign about colorectal cancer screening that led to real world changes in the amount of colorectal screening that happened. So I think the role of legislators as public figures people who legislate, and then also political figures makes them kind of uniquely important when we're thinking about the forces that are acting on patients as they decide whether or not to actually get the vaccine. There is existing research that has established the partisan difference in the way political figures communicate about COVID-19. You both saw that there was an important gap in the literature where no prior research has characterized vaccine-related Twitter activity of state and federal legislators. This is incredibly important work. Can you talk us through the methods and the number of tweets you evaluated from different state and federal legislators? Yeah, so we ended up analyzing like 14,500 tweets about from um, both state and federal legislators. And we did that using a, a pretty interesting data source that we've used for a few other projects actually called Quorum. Um, and it's a platform that collects basically all of the public facing content from state and federal legislators. So that includes things like legislation itself, but also all of their activity on Twitter, or Facebook, or YouTube. And it's a searchable database. So we were able to search by these keywords. Um, and ultimately the number of tweets, these 14,500 came from uh, 1,984 legislators. That's including both the state and federal. 
And the vast majority of those, about 75%, were state legislators, which kind of fits with what we know, that they're just more state legislators than federal legislators. And so in terms of what we then did with those tweets, the bulk of the analysis was uh, different parts of a natural language processing analysis. So without going too in the weeds, I would say there were kind of three main approaches that we took. So the first was looking specifically at word and term frequency. So just seeing, comparing Democrat and Republican legislators, Twitter content, um, were there certain words or two word phrases that were more commonly used um, by one political party or the other. And then the second was a topic modeling analysis. So uh, the topic modeling approach that we ended up using was LDA. Very bare bones, I think of LDA as like, a big data approach to qualitative research and that we're able to kind of um, leverage machine learning tools to be able to uh, identify topics or collections of commonly occurring words and then look at how frequently those topics are coming up across uh, these tweets. Um, and so we were able to look at the the frequency of the topics coming up by political party, and then also looking at that over time and seeing if the gap was widening or narrowing over time between what politicians were talking about as sort of a proxy for whether or not partisanship around the issue of vaccination was changing throughout the course of the early pandemic. This was like from February to December of 2020. In your results, you demonstrated that Republicans and Democrats use different words with different frequency in their vaccine tweets. Can you talk more about this? Like you said, uh, there were differences in kind of the most frequently used words by Republicans and Democrats. And I'll give a few examples. Um, Republicans uh, tended to use words like Operation Warp Speed, Record Time, Innovation. Uh, Democrats uh, used words like Anti-Vaxxer, Community, Public Health. Um, free. Uh, and in general, the words that Republicans used were kind of more narrowly focused on successful development of a vaccine and kind of naming that project as Operation Warp Speed. And Democrats had, on the other hand, kind of a broad and wide ranging conversation that was less focused, less consistent and covered a wide range of topics. Overall, interestingly, the keywords that were used by Republicans were more highly partisan um, than the words used by Democrats. And I think that finding, as well as the range of words that we found were associated with Republicans versus Democrats, um, is kind of consistent with this idea that the Republican Party messaging around vaccines was highly focused and highly consistent in a way that the Democratic messaging was kind of less so. There were topics that Republicans clearly spent more time tweeting about. Can you talk about the top two? We found that the two topics that the Republican Party was more likely to tweet about were Operation Warp Speed Success and then COVID-19 vaccine efficacy. I think there's some interesting things about that in particular. I think one is that there was a lot of consistency and like the specifics of the language that Republican legislators were using. So this phrase safe and effective, and also the branding of Operation Warp Speed just came up again and again in the tweets of the Republican legislators. And we just didn't see that same consistency in language among tweets by Democratic legislators. And I think the other thing that's kind of interesting is that given that so many of these tweets were sort of celebrating the success of Operation Warp Speed, we do still see now a really large gap um, among Democratic and Republican constituents in terms of vaccination rates. And I was just looking recently for like more updated data. And it seems like in September of uh, 2021, the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, had uh, rates of 90% of Democrats having received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine compared with 58% of Republicans. And, you know, that gap being as big as it is, given that in December of 2020, Republican legislators were really excited about the speed and, and also talking consistently about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Uh, I think there's sort of an interesting discrepancy there. Thank you for all that information. And now we're going to flip over to talking about your findings on the Democrat side. Your research hi highlights that Democrats clearly spent more time tweeting about 
different topics or a broader range of topics. Can you talk about the top two? Here, the top two were influenza and then this discussion around anti-vaxxers. So the influenza topic, that was driven a lot by discussion in the fall of 2020 around um, trying to encourage people basically to get the flu vaccine still. And then for anti-vaxxers, that was a topic that was more consistently coming up in, in tweets by Democratic legislators even before the pandemic. Um, and I think, again, kind of connecting it back to the topics that were most prevalent with Republican uh, legislators, What's interesting here is, first of all, that the top two topics were way less consistently showing up. So it's 5.9 and 4.6% for these top two Democratic topics versus 12.3 and 6.8% for the top two Republican topics. So that's a pretty big difference. Um, and then I think also that we see, you know, the table of topics that uh, that are coming up more frequently among Democratic tweets are it's just a, a much broader range that points to maybe a little bit more nuance and more willingness to talk about uh, non-COVID-19 vaccine, which we have seen uh, in prior research, um, but also less consistency in messaging, which I think, you know, from a constituent standpoint could be uh, a little bit confusing. You also tracked how talking about different topics demonstrated a widening partisan gap. Can you talk about the widening partisan gap? In addition to looking at topic prevalence by party over the entire time period, we also tried to look at prevalence by party in each month, um, so from February to December of 2020. Um, and this actually, the idea for this came in part from a prior study that I had worked on that was around how state legislators talked about the opioid epidemic. And we saw essentially that trending this over time, seeing you know, the difference in topic prevalence over time was a reasonable proxy for uh, a gap in how Democrats and Republicans were, were talking about the opioid epidemic. And we thought you know, maybe we would see the same with vaccination in this uh, first year of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because for the COVID-19 vaccine, I think it was, it was kind of a more nuanced picture and that there were some topics that the gap clearly did widen for over time. Things like Operation Warp Speed in December as that started to gain traction from Republicans. Um, then things like masking and social distancing as a bridge to vaccination, which was a much more prevalent topic amongst Democrats and that gap only grew. But then for other topics uh, like, um, you know, how political pressure may impact this vaccine safety, essentially, like if we're rushing the vaccine through a political process that it might lead to a less safe vaccine, that topic, uh, you know, really narrowed in the gap between Democrats and Republicans and became one that both parties were talking about more uh, towards the latter half of the study, which Eden will we'll chat more about. So overall, I think from at least April to November of 2020, we saw that there was this trend towards a widening gap in what Democrats were talking about compared with Republicans, um, which I think kind of reflects at least what I felt as someone living during that time, that it was an increasingly politicized issue in the country. Several topics showed decreasing partisan gap over time, including a very important one, which is the impact of political pressure on vaccine safety. Can you talk about the decrease in the gap for the impact of political pressure on vaccine safety? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this topic was of particular interest to us, uh, both because uh, intuitively you can imagine as a follower of a politician, this would be a topic that may cause you concern. Um, to, to see kind of appearing on your Twitter feed. But it was also of interest to us because there is actually survey data using um, kind of a mechanical Turk survey data approach uh, where folks were randomized to a headline that implied political pressure was impacting the vaccine approval process. And the authors of that study found a decreased willingness to obtain a COVID vaccine in the exposure group. So intuitively, it's a concerning topic. And then there's also evidence that it has real world impacts on folks' comfort with the vaccine. 
Um, so in terms of thinking about how we saw this topic in our study, uh, this was a topic that was initially of particular concern to Democrats, which makes sense given that the vaccine was developed under Republican administration. But as you can see in our paper, by the fall of our study period, both parties were discussing this topic. Um, and I think this speaks to some degree to one of the limitations of the natural language processing approaches we used in this study, uh, which is that while we can capture topic prevalence, we're unable to capture valence. Um, and I know from my own uh, manual review of the data set somewhat more informally, that the increase in Republican engagement with this topic was in fact driven by Republicans kind of refuting the topic, saying that in fact, political pressure is not what's driving um, the vaccine approval process. So I think this speaks to the, the kind of challenges and limitations of natural language processing. But regardless, um, as this debate kind of waged on on Twitter, as the pandemic progressed, eventually it became kind of significant enough that both parties um, were talking about it, albeit um, from kind of different valence perspectives. Um, so yeah, so I would say taken together, I think this finding speaks to the dangers of uh, politicization, um, the dangers of framing uh, the COVID vaccine in this way, but also speaks to some degree to the limitations of natural language processing approaches um, on, on Twitter data and the need for um, more research in this space. Overall, you found that Republicans and Democrats use different words, phrases, and topics to discuss vaccination during the COVID-19 era. Specifically, you found that messaging in the Republican Party was more focused and consistent. You highlight your previous research showing that Republican legislators were only minimally engaged in Twitter discussions about vaccinations before COVID-19. You have a hypothesis around the narrow focus on Operation Warp Speed. Can you talk about both of these? Yeah, so in the kind of pre-COVID era, and this was from kind of a, an initial paper that, that was published in Human Vaccines and Immunotherapeutics, we found that uh, the majority of pre-COVID-19 era vaccine-related tweets were uh, generated by Democrat and state legislators. So it was primarily a topic that was of local interest and of interest on the left. Um, and then unsurprisingly, there was a really big increase in tweets about vaccination when COVID arrived. Um, and that increase was much bigger among Republican legislators and among federal legislators, um, more so than Democrat or state legislators. So we watched this become a local uh, left issue to uh, kind of become a natural issue of um, more universal interest. Um, and this is kind of exciting as somebody who cares about vaccine messaging to see more people be involved in talking about vaccination online. Um, and in that paper, we hypothesized that Republican vaccine engagement may have increased in part because the development of a COVID vaccine during a Republican administration would represent this kind of massive political victory um, for Republicans. Um, and what we found in this paper backed up that hypothesis, I think. We found this pretty narrow focus on Operation Warp Speed and successful vaccine development um, on the Republican side. And I think that kind of backs up our thesis from our original paper. And I think kind of to dive into that a little further, we saw an increase in the topic prevalence of Operation Warp Speed success um, as we approached the fall and election season. And I think that kind of further argues for the framing of the vaccine as a political victory, potentially on the right. Um, I think one potential implication of this hypothesis is that in a, a post-COVID-19 future, will we see a return to the dynamics that we saw prior to COVID where uh, vaccination was of more interest on the left and of more interest locally. And I think that would be kind of a loss in, in that having kind of all parties and people at all level invested in this topic is probably a good thing. You found that Democrats used a broader set of topics to discuss vaccination during the COVID-19 era. Can you talk about this? So what we found is that uh, Democrats did use a wider range of keywords and topics to talk about vaccination, whether that was about the cost of vaccines, how they would be distributed, um, vaccines for illnesses other than COVID-19, including the flu. Um, and so Democrats were having this kind of more wide ranging conversation. 
Um, and I think importantly, that conversation covered a set of topics that were quite consistent with the topics that were covered by public health messaging at that stage in the pandemic as well. So um, I think that uh, as in kind of in the same way that we have kind of concluded that Republicans were having a more narrow focused conversation, Democrats were having a more uh, wide ranging conversation covering the same topics that formal public health messaging was covering. And this is consistent with other data in the literature um, that has found um, increased signal boosting between public health messengers on Twitter and Democrat uh, leaning folks. So I think this is quite consistent with, with existing literature. Overall, the bulk of your study was notable for increased polarization among federal and state legislators. Why is this so important to vaccine hesitancy? There are a few reasons why this is really important. Um, I think first and foremost is this body of experimental evidence that exposure to politicized communication about vaccinations can lead to mistrust and can decrease the likelihood of actually obtaining a vaccine. And that's kind of hugely important. Um, I think this is also an area for further research because while we know this is kind of true in experimental settings, it would be really interesting to see whether the trends we identified in our data led to real time shifts in perspective among the general public. Um, and I think that's an area um, for, for growth. And then I think the other piece here is that, um, and I think this is another area for future research, um, is this question of how legislators tweet and what they tweet about, is it predictive of the ways that they legislate um, and how they legislate around public health issues and vaccination? I think that's another really important area for future research, but, um, but is likely true. Um, so I think there are kind of several important implications um, to, to that increase in polarized communication. What we learned from that analysis um, is that Democrats and Republicans are having fundamentally different conversations about vaccination. And that matters because it means that they are likely legislating in fundamentally different ways around um, vaccination and public health. Um, and I think that's really important um, and potentially has implications for the uh, kind of differences in vaccine uptake that we see uh, between Democrat and re Republican leaning areas. What are your takeaway messages for our followers? I would say that our takeaways are that the language that legislators are using on social media, especially that that language matters. Um, and I think that it's likely to be both guiding and reflecting public discourse more broadly. So um, I think that's one area where, you know, we're going to have to parse out a little bit more which direction it's happening more in. If it's more a reflection of the dialogue that's happening among constituents, or if legislators' conversations on social media are really the drivers of how their constituents are thinking about these issues. As Eden uh, was mentioning, you know, I think the political divide and how legislators are talking about vaccines, it has an impact in how confident the public feels about vaccination more broadly. Um, and in the last couple of years, legislators are talking about vaccines at a level that we've never really seen before. Um, and so the partisanship that we're seeing and talking about the COVID-19 vaccine specifically, I think has broader implications for how the public is going to think about vaccination in general, whether that's the COVID-19 vaccine or other vaccines that are really important to public health. Great. And what are next steps in your research? So I think there are a lot of really exciting new directions that, that these questions could go in. Um, I think one is linking this uh, finding around uh, polarization and these kinds of trends and topics over time to real world outcomes. And whether those outcomes are uh, discussion on Twitter among the general public or actual real time vaccine uptake, I think they're really exciting ways to use analysis of politicians uh, Twitter activity as a barometer for what's going on in the country um, and requires a lot of research to figure out if, if um, their kind of Twitter patterns are predictive of real world outcomes that we care about. So I think that's one uh, real world outcomes is one really exciting place to take this. Um, I think a second potential next step is thinking about um, how the partisanship of uh, legislators impacts or is impacted by the partisanship of their constituents. Um, and thinking about this as really a bi-directional phenomenon and a kind of exchange between constituents and legislators. 
Um, and I think those are kind of some of the potential exciting ways to take this. I guess the last thing I would say is a potential next step in research um, is using real-time analysis of these uh, exciting large social media data sets uh, to kind of inform or predict public health interventions and whether those interventions are around um, restricting or monitoring social media activity or are around targeting particular subgroups for um, you know, further support in accessing the vaccine. I think there are a lot of exciting implications in terms of um, real-time natural language processing analyses approach to these um, exciting new data sets that are increasingly available to researchers. In this new world of infodemics and helping our community find reliable health information, this is important work towards us understanding how our politicians influence health decisions. Thank you to Eden and Daniel for sitting down with me today. All research published in JMIR publications is open access, meaning anyone in the world can read the full details along with figures and data anytime from anywhere. This is Dr. Jennifer Joe, JMIR ambassador. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter.